Reverend Uloma. Yes, Daddy, please. How are this you doing, me. sir? I'm doing okay. I give glory <laughs> to God. Are you? I'm doing very well. Um, I can see. Uh, first of all, I must appreciate you. I thank you so much for all what you've done, um, not just for the faith, but for Nigeria as a whole. I thank you for standing up. Uh, you've been outspoken even before NSAS. Mm -hmm. you, you've spoken against the witches and wizards in the government that is drinking the blood of our future generations. <laughs> I can never forget that video of yours. Yeah. <laughs> so welcome, Reverend <laughs> Father Uluoma. Please give Thank us you. a little bit, a little history, um, a brief history about you. Well, my name is Reverend Father Uloma Chine John. I'm a priest of the Catholic Idolists of Abuja. I was ordained on the 24th of um, September 2005, so I am 15 years in the ministry this year. Um, I have uh, pastored two parishes. I'm in my third parish right now as a parish priest, uh, as we say it. Um, I come from a family of nine. I am the fourth and the third male. I'm um, a passionate uh, lover of football, both um, following the game and playing itself. And uh, also, so this is, I don't know if there's any other thing you want me to say. Of Educational background. Educational background. I did my primary school at uh, Niger State, my secondary school in Abuja here, uh, which is what we, we call it the minor seminary, right? Then after that, I proceeded um, to Makodi, St. Thomas Aquinas, where I did my philosophy. I got uh, my first degree in philosophy. It's also affiliated to uh, the, the Obaniana University in Rome. And after that, I did our own church equivalent of one year service. After your philosophy, you go for one year pastoral service. It's more like the NYSC, the equivalent. After that, I proceeded to just St. Augustine's Major Seminary to do my theology studies for four years. And then um, after that, I, I got to Dend. Yeah, after my ordination, some years back, I tried doing something in the University of Abuja. I had a uh, PGD in, uh, in education. I was in for my master's before the load of work couldn't let me continue. But I'm hoping to go back, finish my master's in education, and perhaps something further. But that's... Um, that's where it is for now. Oh, so that's absolutely wonderful. Um, let's go straight to the meat of it. Your teachings are very popular among Nigerians. Among Nigerians, let me not say Nigerian youths, especially the youth. That's a better way to put it. They're very popular among Nigerians, especially um, the youth, because my mother-in-law is a huge fan, um, and so many of my friends are huge fans of your mm. teachings. Now, what advice do you have for the Nigerian youth with regards to how to make Project Nigeria work? Because Nigeria as a country has struggled to work from inception. Um, I think um, this NSAS protest has um, shown us that if the youth decide to be resolute and strategic they can change the course of history because most of the leaders we have today these recycled leaders they had their first shot at leadership when they were young they were youth when they all of them had their first shot at uh, at leadership the current president became the first uh, he was a military president he was barely 30 or maybe just a little bit um, above 30. That was uh, in his youthful um, um, age. So my advice to the youth is be resolute and be strategic. It's very important to be strategic. Even this answers protest that's going on now, they need to cash in on it. They don't need to let it waste because the protest is just uh, a movement. You need to translate it into strategic action that will get the government to accede to your demands. So I will say our youth should be uh, resolute. 
in seeking a new Nigeria, and then they should be strategic about it. Okay, um, since we're talking about NSAS, what is the Catholic Church's standpoint on freedom of speech with regards to the right to protest? Oh, very clear on that. The, church, the Catholic Church is insistent on the freedom of speech, is insistent on the freedom of, uh, of protest in a democratic setting. Uh, peaceful protest, peaceful protest is a hallmark of democracy, and the Catholic Church insists on that. It is contained in the, a body of teaching regarded as the social teachings of the church. So the Catholic Church is in support of a peaceful protest in uh, Nigeria. Now, um, a lot of us have listened to your messages, and we have seen the passion with which you speak the truth. Because of reverence like you, many Christians who have lost hope in the faith are beginning to return to the faith. How does that make you feel and what message do you have for these people? First of all, I feel humbled to hear that um, um, my messages are making impact on the life of uh, Christians and even non-Christians. Um, um, I remember St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 10, he said, what I am, I am by the grace of God. So I see it as the grace of God uh, working in my life. And uh, I want to encourage such people that they should remember that um, we are neither the message nor the owner of the message we preach. Our message as priests, as pastors come from God. So they shouldn't let our life eclipse the light of God, which our message is supposed to represent. Yes. So at the point, Jesus told the Jews, he said, the Pharisees occupy the chair of Moses. Do what they say, but don't do what they do, because they are not showing example. Yeah. So many of us in the ministry are like that. We don't live, we don't show example, which is unfortunate. So my encouragement to them is, when we become contradictory, when our lifestyles become contradictory to the message we preach, they should please look beyond us. Hebrews 12 to say, Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. They should find a way of looking beyond us and focusing on Christ. Yeah. Okay. Um, Big Brother ended a few minutes, a few weeks ago and while it was on the entire attention of our youths was focused in that direction more people voted in big brother more youths voted in big brother than in the last three elections combined i am sure with the number of votes and the amount generated what advice do you have for those youths who are caught up in things like Big Brother and not very attentive when pertinent issues regarding Nigeria as a country, our nascent democracy uh, and our future are concerned. What uh, Personally, I don't have anything against Big Brother. I don't know if you do, but what message do you have to those people who are caught up in this uh, funfair, fanfare of Big Brother while serious issues lay fallow? What my advice to them is this, like you said, I am not also, uh, I don't have a problem with Big Brother. For me, it is uh, one of the options available for people as far as entertainment is concerned. As a Christian, you're supposed to know, St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he said, though all things might be lawful, but not all things are beneficial to me. A mature Christian should know what is lawful and legal, but does not give you any benefit. I will put it this way. It's not everything that is interesting that is of your interest or that is to your interest. So, our uh, Nigeria, you should know this. Not everything that is interesting. Big Brother Nigeria is interesting. Betting is interesting. Going for white parties, all these things are interesting. But are they to your own interest? Are they to your own advantage? That's um, where they need to draw the line. I don't think so. So, they should create a little time for such entertainment. But like you said, when issues that affect their life, their future, come up, they should devote more energy, more attention to such issues. So it will be foolish of anybody to be attentive to Big Brother Niger, but you don't care about politics, about policies, 
and about movements that are meant to make your life better. Mm. I, I totally agree. I totally agree with that. And um, I sometimes find it uh, worrisome, the direction in which uh, our minds as young Nigerians, uh, the, the direction of focus of our minds. Now, politics and the faith. Should Catholic priests be allowed to go into politics? Should they be allowed to contest for Nigerian president, for instance? Because the scriptures say, where the righteous are in power, the people rejoice. What is your take with regards to that? Freeze, you are trying to put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, um, it may sound uh, interesting or inviting that priests, because of their calling, should go into um, politics, you know. But the church, the Catholic Church says no, priests cannot be partisan for a good number of um, reasons. From history, from history, uh, and uh, from so many other considerations. And I want to stand with my church. I don't think priests should go into partisan politics. They should rather stay as conscientizers, as sensitizers, as awareness, awareness creators. Yes. You know, Jesus did not go into politics. He didn't encourage the apostles to go and all that. So we are following his footsteps uh, directly. So no priests cannot go into partisan politics, but they should be interested in politics. <laughs> Very well put. <laughs> now, um, let's talk a little bit about Biafra. Uh, there was a point where uh, it seemed, I may be wrong, I stand corrected, uh, that you favored restructuring over Biafra. Which region will benefit the most if we restructure Nigeria today? And what are your thoughts now regarding Biafra? Um, I've made it clear. Um, I have no case against people agitating for Biafra or any other republic. Um, like we said, the, the, uh, I think it's enshrined in the, whether it's in the UN Charter, uh, the right to self-determination is um, is recognized globally as long as it is done uh, legally even in u.s there was a time that uh, the people of uh, uh, was it texas or california were also agitating to have their own separate country pull out of the union i mean the central government the u.s government did not clamp down on them the UN government only engaged with them which is the normal thing so for the pro france or the epops um, it, there is a philosopher, is it so I can't remember, who says, even though I don't like what you are saying, but I will defend your right to say what you want to say. You know? So they deserve the freedom to express what they want within the ambit of the law. Go about their protest peacefully. Don't disrupt other people's activities. Don't force people who don't want to be part of it to be part of it. Express your opinion. Pursue your legitimate right in the legitimate way. If it works for you, fine. But for me as an individual, I prefer restructuring. And I feel that, I believe sorry, that when Nigeria is restructured, every region will benefit. Because they keep telling us that when Nigeria was operating the regional government, you have the, the northern region, you have the southwestern region, you have the eastern region, when you have the likes of the Abafemi, Awolo was the Zik, the Amandu Bellos, why would we even have oil? We were told that there was steady progress. Many things were accomplished without oil, just by what they could find from those regions, because the leaders then had to work. So when you restructure Nigeria, make it a through fiscal federation, where states control their resources and they are taxed to pay certain to the central government, which has some uh, responsibilities. I think these governors, because this present system encourages laziness and indolence. Where a governor doesn't have to do anything, think anything, he doesn't even have to tax his brain. All he knows that at the end of the month, a lot will come from Abuja. It is part of what is making them lazy. So when you restructure, 
every state you now know that you have to walk you develop at your pace that your 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 your, your pace of development is dependent on the hard work the diligence the cleverness that you put into it so when we restructure nigeria will be better it will take care of nepotism it will take care of tribalism it will destroy this unhealthy competition for who is at the center or who rules this so i am still an avid unapologetic proponent of restructuring it is the way for nigeria to go yes the way joseph spoke in front of pharaoh after telling him what to do in the next 14 years and you know what came next pharaoh made him prime minister <laughs> so prepare for a ministerial appointment after this <laughs> even though you are trying to agree that uh, as preacher, there's really no place in politics. Uh, but as yeah. a Joseph who sees into the future, your advice in the place of power is very, very necessary. Let's talk a little bit about the gospel. We all are aware that the gospel today has largely been commercialized. What is your take? Ah. Uh... Um, it's, it's right here in the Bible. I might not have the particularism, but I think it's in Second Timothy. St. Paul was telling um, Timothy that he should be careful that in the last days, people will collect for themselves a number of uh, teachers who will teach them what they want to hear. They will have itching ears. They want to hear uh, new things. Thank you very much, you know. So, uh, it's right here in the scripture, and I'm sure it didn't even start in our generation, but you're very right. The gospel has been commercialized, and it's really a cause of concern. Uh, I have um, um, I, I have been, in my only two way, talking um, against it, and it is a virus that does nobody good. It is a virus that destroys the gospel itself. The Bishop of Usoka made reference to it one day. He said, listen, that Christianity in Nigeria will be destroyed not by external forces, but by this internal, um, internal, uh, uh, let me call them viruses of false messages of a uh, um, uh, merchandise gospel, just like you put it, commercialized gospel. Those things are injuring Christianity even much more than the persecutions that we get from outside. Yeah, so commercialization of the gospel is a virus and it needs to be, uh, we need to get an antivirus for it. <laughs> Now, being the Joseph of our time, or one of the Josephs of our time, how are you giving me that title? You know? huh? You're giving me that title. Yes, I'm giving you because it's a problem. Pharaoh presented a problem. Joseph not <laughs> only was the visionary, he was part of the solution. So what yeah. do you propose? How do you think... Um, the gospel can be taken back to what it used to be. Because if you remember um, 1 Timothy chapter 6, if you read verse 5, it says, these people always cause trouble. Their minds are corrupt and they have turned their back onto the truth. To them, godliness is a means of financial gain. So even the scriptures... Okay. Yes. Speaking. Yes. Um, sorry to. Yeah. Sorry to cut you. So, um, I have been thinking about it, and um, I'm not sure it's going to be an easy. Uh, there's not going to be an easy solution to it. But let's go back to the um, to the Bible in the Acts of the Apostles, um, when the first Christians had the issue of the circumcision, whether Gentiles should be circumcised or not. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. He's the one who has been on the mission. And then these certain yes. Judaizers came and said, even if you accept Jesus, but you don't get circumcised, you don't have salvation. You know, that was a big rumble in the junk, so to say. It was a big problem. How did they settle it? Paul had to come back to Jerusalem where the apostolic uh, group or where the men apostles were. And they sat down, had their, we call it the first council of the church. They sat down, had fruitful discussion 
about it, prayed about it, and at the end they came out with something. And they look at the letter they wrote, they say, we and the Holy Spirit. That means they prayed about it, came about, uh, about their, their point. And then St. Paul that Christians don't need, Gentiles don't need to be circumcised. It is your faith in Christ that justifies you. Then they gave them some moral codes, what they should do or what they should not do. Now what I'm looking at is the method of settling disputes or disagreements then. That means there was authority. There was central authority. Now, a Catholic priest, it is difficult for a Catholic priest to remain a Catholic priest and preach certain gospel. Because he knows that there is an authority he's answerable to. He will be called to order. If he must preach something that is outside the tenets of the Catholic faith, both the way the Catholic Church interprets the, the Bible, he's going to be questioned. So he has one option, obey or leave. There is authority. So I am thinking that we have the Christian Association of Nigeria, but I don't think this might be of a decent. The different... Um, blocks of Christianity have, they should establish their, their own authority. I think the Pentecostal have the Pentecostal Fellowship of Nigeria. I don't know how strong it is. Um, so all the different le leaders of Christianity can come together and decide that before anybody is certified a preacher, the person should have some level of training in uh, both scriptural interpretation and certain things about the church, and that each group should be able to call their members to order. If you are daddy freeze, I suppose you are a Pentecostal uh, uh, pastor, that's uh, the group you belong to. If you are daddy freeze preaches anything that is, everybody knows is contrary to the spirit of the scripture, which is your uh, basic authority. Mm -hmm. Your fellowship or the organization should be able to call, even if not to arrest you, because you have freedom of uh, religion, everybody can say what he say, but they should be able to come out with a hard message and say, this person is not preaching um, the gospel of Christ. Let us reinterpret and all of that. That, for me, is one of the ways I'm seeing it. Then, for the other ministers who understand, we should keep talking, we shouldn't keep quiet. We should let people know that what this man Sorry, you have done it a number of times, and I'm sure it has got you into some trouble. When when you take the courage to <laughs> when you take the courage to correct um, any pastor, not minding his status and all of that, that is also one of the ways. But now you see the problem. You do that, and his followers are after you. And they are like, who is it to talk to our pastor? But they are not looking at the merit of what you are saying. All they are looking at is the enigma of their pastor. They don't care whether what you're saying is right or not. And so that's a big problem. That if that's a big problem. So I am proposing two things. Authority, there has to be some kind of authority. And then number two, let's take the courage and keep um, correcting or teaching the right thing. And I think you are at the forefront of that. Even though if we may not, may not agree with you all the time in what you say or, or, or how you interpret certain uh, texts, yeah. But that you can call out a man of God and say, this thing scripturally is wrong. It's a way to go. Yes, um, towards the end, I will try to, I would raise some of my doctrinal issues with you and maybe one or two and uh, we'll talk about them but since we're talking about power and authority and the enigma of the pastor is it okay for a pastor to lay curses on someone who criticizes their doctrine or their ideology or their manner in which um they're preaching is it right if a priest if for instance now i went outside and said uh pastor loma miss the doctrine he's a liar he uh, if you if i say you're a liar and i bring up the scripture to back it up it's no longer an insult it's you now have to prove that you're not a liar because this other scripture uh shows a contrary opinion but many of these our pastors will just climb their pulpits and say die holy spirit fire how do you see doctrines like that um, they are unchristian. They are unchristian because Jesus said it specifically. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who insult you. You know? So it is not right for a pastor, a minister, to call somebody who disagrees um, with him over an issue. 
Even if the person insults you, you know, blessed are those who are persecuted for the cause of righteousness. They shall inherit the kingdom of God. Yes. So, Jesus himself did not retaliate. He was caused, he was insulted, he was spat on. He did not utter a word. And we say we are copying um, um, Jesus Christ. No. And another reason why I don't even think they should do that is that those causes are useless. They are meaningless. They are not following anybody. No, they are not following anybody. You, you are not... We, you, we, yeah, we can't play God. You are not God. God decides... You know, the problem with some ministers in Nigeria, they think that they have God's... Uh, what do you call it? Mumu button. As we say in Nigeria. They think that they tell God what to do. No, it doesn't happen like that. Because if it happens like that, and many of them have been cursing for long, we should have been seeing dead bodies now as it happened. When you try to correct them, they will tell you, oh, Elijah did this. Elijah caught fire down. Oh, yeah, caught fire down. When Elijah caught, fire came down immediately. He didn't wait for this. So when you curse or call fire, let the fire fall immediately and this is. So for me, no, it's not the best way to go. It does not mean that I'm encouraging people to disrespect a, a man of God. No, 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 no. I'm not doing that. But many of God should be uh, they should be big enough in the spirit to let go, ignore, swallow certain things, you know, after all even if you walk by the biblical uh, principles, uh, the Lord said to Abraham I will cause those who cause you so you are not the one that should cause who is ever is causing you, allow it for God, God didn't say Abraham cause anybody who causes you, no, God said to Abraham I will cause those who cause you, so don't take God's work as a man of God. Leave it for God. If anybody disrespects a man of God, God himself will decide when to deal with the person. It's not the man of God. It doesn't work like that. It's not biblical and yeah, as far as the New Testament is concerned, it's not an aspect of um, our ministry. Share your exciting moments with your family and friends on wildcatholic.com Sign up with the largest community of Catholics online, make new friends, chat, post pictures and videos, make and receive audios and video calls, interact with lots of priests and religions, download the app from Google Play Store. Uh, as a Nigerian, um, I'm sure you are very familiar with the die by fire doctrines. Anybody mm. who is preventing you, uh, the Pentecostals, you classified me as a Pentecostal, I just believe I'm a Christian. Uh, okay. Whatever the Catholic Church submits that I agree with, I hold on to. Uh, whatever the Pentecostal Church submits that I agree with, I hold on to. But one thing I totally am dis in disagreement with is the die by fire doctrines. We as pagans in Africa believe that if something is not working, some enemies are at work. And we very easily transfer that to some aunt in the village, some uncle, some boss, some destiny destroyer or the other. And you would see the greatest geos in Nigeria praying prayers like, anybody that does not want you to see next year, let the ground open and swallow them up. I can personally show you, send you on WhatsApp, several uh, <laughs> of these kind of things. What is your take on that because when i try to correct them and i use matthew chapter 5 for instance and say christ said pray for our enemies too he did not say fight them oh. they say no shut up you be there praying for your enemy and eh, it doesn't make sense if somebody a witch wants to then they'll go into the book of exodus forgetting that they are not following two percent of what is happening in the book of exodus they will now go there and say suffer not a witch to live so what is your take if you for instance found out that your church, your parish member's mother was a witch. Would you pray that she died? Or how would you handle that situation? And what is your take on those die-by-fire doctrines? Well, um, for one, similar to what I answered before, I don't believe in those things. Like I said, freeze. If those prayers worked, if the die-by-fire prayers were to work, eh? Me, I would have prayed it for all these politicians that have held this country hostage. So what it means that under one day, we would have solved our problems as Nigeria. Do you understand? But the first thing I want to say that they don't work. God does not answer such prayers. If God were to be answering those such prayers, those people who are praying die by fire prayer. Remember that some of them are praying for 30 years, some for 20 years. 
And it's like the more they pray them, the more their enemies keep uh, multiplying. So if that Bavaria prayer were to be worked, some of them would not have enemy at all. In fact, they would have finished with their enemy like 10 years ago. But they will say this prayer every day, every week. They are in the same condition. They are in the same situation. Nothing is happening to the imagined or real enemy. So I don't believe it's an effective uh, prayer because God is the one who decides what prayer he answers. And that's not the model of prayer that Jesus taught us. That's not the model of prayer Jesus taught us. A Christian should pray for protection against evil. In the Our Father that Jesus taught us, Matthew say, deliver us from all evil. Do they even know the number of evils God delivers us from every day? Do they even know that? Yes. So, that prayer is, uh, is the prayer of people who don't have faith. It's prayer of faithless people. Yeah. Is the prayer of faith? Enemy people. to die. Father, yeah, Lord, prayer, prayer for your enemy to die is a prayer of those who don't have faith. I'll, 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 yes. I'll use that. <laughs> Thank you for that. Now, let's talk about tithing. Tithing seems to be particularly a very serious issue in the Pentecostal church. In 2017, I came out in an interview going against tithing, and every single geo in Nigeria came out guns blazing. Hey, where is he? Where is he? Where is he? <laughs> so what is the, the, the standpoint of the Catholic church globally and ni in Nigeria? Because I, I, I can see that in Nigeria, uh, there's a slight variation from the global doctrine with regards to tithing. Now, should Christians be threatened with lack and poverty and Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 to 10, the windows of uh, heaven will be opened or closed depending on how much you tight or don't tight. What is your take on that? And do you personally collect tithes? Okay. So, in the Catholic Church, um, tithing is regarded as one of the many ways Christians can give to God. It is not a doctrine. In the Catholic Church, we have what you call doctrine. A doctrine is an obligation you must follow. It is not subject to your rationalization. It is like an obligation on you. Then there are things we call piety, pious acts of individual Christians. Okay? So tithing is not a doctrine, it's not a dogma in the Catholic Church. Tithing is, um, is optional. You have options. In the Catholic Church, we have what you call the collection or the offertory. You have a tithing. You have a Udu Harvest and Bazaar. We do a free will donation. We can do launching if we have um, a project and all of that. So it is up to you. You give according to the one you feel is important to you. What we preach to people is when there is a project or a cause, be generous in supporting it. So do I collect that in my church? Yes, because there are people who are eager to pay, who wants to pay by themselves. I have never thought about tithing. We don't teach about tithing. And we don't say that if you pay your tithe, prosperity will follow you. Or that if you don't pay your tithe, Things will not be good for you. We don't any Kali priest that yes, any Kali priest that says that is not in line with the Kali Church and he can be summoned by his bishop. So we don't attach any particular blessing to tithing. What we teach about is generosity. If you want to call your own tithe, that's up to you. If you want to call your own seed, that's up to you. We teach people about generosity. God rewards generosity. You can do it according to the different ways that um, are available. And let me tell you, in my church, I pastor the church of more than almost uh, four or 5,000 people in Kubwa, CKC. I'm not, they are not up to 5% that pay tithe. And they do it freely. Nobody uh, cajoles them. It is an option. Some wants to do it. Some people, you try to even stop them. They don't want to say, Father, this is my faith. This is what I believe. Fine. Go ahead and do it. But remember, God does not bless you according to your tithe. God does not single out tithers to bless them above those who don't tithe. If that were to be so, then non-Christians shouldn't be prospering. 
And I tell my people, even those who believe that seed sowing is the way to prosperity, I tell them that's not true. If that were to be true, non-Christians should not be prospering. But we have very non-Christian nations that are prosperous. We have people who are non-Christians. Yes, and they are very prosperous, more than Christians. And then you come among Christians, there are many of them who are titan, they are still poor. So you don't give titan. Sorry, I did a teaching, I said, you don't give because of your need. You give because there is a need. Your gift to God is not a bribe to him. You, you do not obligate God when you give, no. Just know that God decided that he will be rewarding generosity and he rewards it according to his own time, whatever he wants, how he wants it. So if anybody comes and teaches titan like um, a watertight, short cock uh, way of being prosperous, that person is, 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 is not right. The person is misleading people. Jesus did not teach about tithe. Jesus mentioned tithe in passing. But he talks about being generous. Give and you shall be given. A full measure, pressed down, shaking together, running over. He, he didn't make it that you must pay tithe. The apostles did not preach tithe. We don't know whether there were people who paid tithe during the apostolic time. But St. Paul campaigned for generosity among the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 8. When he had a cause somewhere else to, to meet, he asked them to be, to be generous. I didn't hear him talk about tithe. So I think there is too much uh, emphasis or, if you want, over-exaggeration of what tithe is all about. Freeze for me is just an option. If anybody believes it, the person should go ahead. But I will tell you, Point blank. Don't think that God will bless you because you are paying tithe and you will not bless another person who is not paying tithe. It doesn't work like that. God is mysterious. All we know is that he rewards generosity. Be generous. Generous. Now, um, you preach about positive actions to back our prayers because prayers and faith alone cannot save us. What actions can Christians in Kaduna, for instance, do to end the persecution in that region and in other regions where the gospel of Christ is being opposed fiercely? Yeah, um, like the answers demonstration we are doing, they should take civic, um, um, civic action, like to protest and write to the... Um, uh, global organizations or international organizations that uh, put pressure on governments um, to do things. And uh, these are the things they should be doing. They should form partnership with um, uh, other communities that are uh, more at peace. You know? So yeah, with prayer and um, positive action, we can actually bring a change. So they shouldn't just stop at praying. Do your activism, demonstrate, uh, reach out to uh, international organizations and, uh, and all of that. In those are positive actions, I feel that um, uh, can bring a lasting change. Yeah. Okay. Um, fuel pump price, especially during this pandemic, what is your take? The increase, the hike? <laughs> fuel pump price. Mm. This is the Majority of the members of this government were those who um, protested against the regulation in 2012. And um, when this government came in place, one of the promises they made is that they are going to fix the refineries. At least everybody knows that that was what they said. So five years down yeah. the road, no refinery seems to be uh, working. And then you have increased fuel. Uh, pump price and all of that. So, for me, the hypocrisy, the inconsistency, is 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 is, 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 is a stench, and all of that. So it's either now that they are realizing, and they have not even had the courage to come and apologize to Nigeria because I have been talking about the regulation. I did not support the protest in 2012. I believed in the regulation, allow market forces to determine prices. If we had done it in 2012, this is 2020, that's like eight years ago, things would have stabilized. You know, the economy was better then than it is now. Things would have been better, would have gone through that and all of that. But you postponed what is supposed to be a strategic action to making the economy good and now you are bringing it back and they are not even doing it thoroughly today you increase pump price you put it at a certain peg you know you cannot do that 
If you want to deregulate, you deregulate, put the, the palliatives in place and deregulate, you know. So it's the manner in which they are going through all these things. You know, when you, when you thrive on propaganda, you will also tie yourself. When it is time to say yes or no, you'll be confused on how to say it. So if the poor price is as a result of market forces, I wouldn't mind. But this government um, arbitrary increment and reduction in, in pump price is what I don't uh, like. Then on electricity tariff, ah, me, I'm not sure I'm in support of that one. No. I'm not sure I'm in support of that one. If you are going to increase um, um, electricity um, tariff, first of all, we haven't even seen the constancy of uh, power. Let power be constant for a year, uninterrupted in Nigeria. Don't let's have uninterrupted power supply in Nigeria for a year. Then the next year, ten Nigerians, in order to sustain this, will have to increase gradually. Nigerians will reason with you. And on that, but I mean, you stay one week, you have not seen light, three days, you have not seen light, then all of a sudden you want to increase um, the pump. I think they have problems with their policies and all of that. It's, government has issues with policies. They are very crude in the way they are running the country because if they were to fine tune their policies and their frameworks, these are decisions they would have taken long ago and this country would have been in a better place. Okay, um, what's the end result? What do you see as the end result of the NSAS protest? And is there a possibility that hoodlums and um, unscrupulous elements could hijack this peaceful and peaceable protest uh, and derail its noble cause? That's my fear, that the freeze, that's my fear. I'm getting scared that um, because the hoodlums are beginning to infiltrate um, you know, gradually, you are now seeing that in some places there are violence. In Abuja here, somebody was macheted to death over this peaceful protest by hoodlums. Hoodlums that were pro probably sponsored by those who want to discredit um, the protest. So that's my fear that that may be going towards that um, direction. Then the second fear I have is. Um, the protesters have to cash in on the momentum they have gathered and demand certain things from government. I think they say it's negotiation. At a point, every protest has to end at the negotiating table, so to say. I don't know whether this is the right time now to negotiate or if we push the protest further, are you sure that it's not going to lose the steam and lose the momentum and eventually to just be a protest that happened and nothing came out of it? I want this protest to end in specific demands made on government for certain things to change in Nigeria. I have advised the protesters, we are not just ending SARS. We want the police reformed. And one of the... Um, one of the items I mentioned is decentralization of the police force. In the United States of America, in the United Kingdom, you don't have one police force policing all the whole country. You have federal police, you have a state police, you have local police. They should decentralize the police force in Nigeria. We don't need this particular uh, system. It's not working. Each state should have its own police governed by, in the UK, they have what they call the police uh, something council that sets the agenda for the police. Then the commissioner of police for the state will drive it. And people of the police of the state should be people who know the terrain. There must not necessarily be the tribe of that place, but somebody who grows up in Imo state, schools there, and, and all of that, is qualified to be in the police force in Imo state. Funding will be an issue. And I'm saying that the freeze. Why we hear that there is something called a security vote for governors, which they don't account for. Why can't they use that security vote to fund state police? So these are my fears. I hope that this uh, protest will end in, in the reformation or restructuring of the police or the security architecture in Nigeria. Of course, uh, uh, increment of the, of the remuneration of our police officers, their salaries are, are abysmally poor and all of that. So, so th those are my fears and those are my expectations. We're hoping that uh, at a point we can get the government to sit down and uh, do this um, 
a fundamental change. Fundamental change. We don't even, we want something, a change that will be backed by legislation, not something that happens by presidential fiat. We don't want any, uh, any charitable um, uh, crumbs tossed at us by the president, like disbanding the SARS and then forming a new one. And no, we want something backed by, by legislation that will at least the president. And for me, anything less than restructuring the police force, let's have state police. Federal police should have their specific jobs like terrorism and some other things, counterterrorism and other things. Why the state police should take care of everything security in the state. That, that for me is going to give a lasting uh, solution to this, or that will give a, a framework for a better policing in Nigeria. All right. Um, should Catholic priests be allowed to get married or not? If the Pope makes it optional for Catholic priests to get married, would you, for instance, get married? What's your take on that? I have a pretty wife waiting for me from your own home that I can marry. Oh, yes. <laughs> for a man like you, you will find wife. <laughs> you will find wife and keep you in the family. <laughs> Well, you see, the question, should the Catholic priest marry, is actually beyond the individual. You, you can't even answer it. The, the thing now is that Catholic priests don't marry. Maybe the question would have been, why do Catholic priests not marry? Because there are some um, options that are not open. They are closed. Catholic priests do not marry. It's been um, uh, a long-standing um, tradition. But what people do not know is that there is... Um, a tradition or there is another part of the catholic tradition where priests are allowed to marry we call them the orthodox churches yeah catholic priests marry in the orthodox churches um, you can find them uh, 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 especially around the middle eastern parts and all of that they, they are still under the pope they are still catholics but they are allowed to uh, marry but we in the western rights we are called the western right or the roman right we are not allowed to marry because of the promise of celibacy you know and um, there are reasons for that there are historical reasons there are biblical reasons there are theological uh, reasons for that for me as an individual um, would i consider marriage as a catholic priest i cannot have both maybe if you say next word if god calls me to come into this world and ask me to choose between priesthood and uh, marriage uh, i will tell him give me one year to go and think about it <laughs> but for now i am very happy being a catholic priest and yeah there are challenges but marriage for the catholic priest no it's not an option and we knew it long before we accepted to be an uh, ordained priest Two quick doctrinal questions. Um, the Catholic Church, from my understanding, has no problem with alcohol except it is abused. While the Pentecostal yes. Church believes that, or largely believes that if you drink alcohol, it's a sin. Uh, so from a theological, scriptural point of view, I want to ask you a straight on question. Did Christ drink alcohol while he was on earth? Yes, he did. Your yes, take did. on the consumption of alcohol and the Catholic Church's take? Like my like Catholic Church teaches, alcohol consumption is not a, a sin. It's when you drink, abuse it. Same thing with food. There's something that is the sin of gluttony. Gluttony is when you eat excess food. So even food, you can sin through eating um, excess of it. So drinking alcohol isn't... Um, um, isn't a sin. Jesus drank. How do you prove that? You remember when Jesus was complaining about um, I think the scribes and the Pharisees he says this generation we don't know what you want. He says you are like children in the marketplace. They say we sang for you, you did not dance. Then we played dead. You did not weep. And then he said John the Baptist came neither eating nor drinking and you say he was possessed. Now the Son of Man has come eating and drinking and you say behold a drunkard 
So how could he be called a drunkard if he did not take wine? Juice does not intoxicate. It is wine that intoxicates. Jesus went for parties. In the Mediterranean, the, Jew, the Israel is among the Mediterranean countries. In the Mediterranean countries, wine is part of their staple. In fact, those days it was, better, it was safer to drink wine than water because certain bacteria and germ cannot exist in, a, in a alcohol, but they exist in water. They didn't have much water hygiene like we have these days. You know, so they took alcohol and wine. Every wine is alcoholic. It's fermented. It's from the grape. It's not, uh, there is no, it's not in Nigeria that we have, we have that uh, appendage, alcoholic, non-alcoholic wine. There is no something like non-alcoholic wine. It's either a fruit juice, a beverage, or it is a wine. So, you don't take it um, in excess. And there are many places where even the kingdom of God, wine is used to describe the joy of the kingdom. Isaiah, um, Isaiah 26, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will prepare for all people a rich banquet of fine wine, well-strained wine. That is uh, the Bible describing it, you know. So these people who have problem with uh, alcohol, they are on their own. No? We are drinking it. Uh -huh. <laughs> Jesus told his disciples, he said, he says, on, on, on the eve of his crucifixion, he said, I will not drink this wine with you again until we get to the kingdom. So they may, not, they may even be surprised that in heaven itself there is wine. Maybe when they get to heaven and they see wine, many of them will leave. But quickly, there, is still, there are still some groups in the Catholic Church who still see alcohol as a sin. So it's not just a Pentecostal thing. There are some groups. Uh, but then there are those who for, if you call one, call it religious reason, abstain from it. And we have no problem for, for the. For uh, for that because I can decide to give up something as a religious practice to you know treat, uh, keep my body in check and all of that but what the culture does not want is you making your personal piety a standard for judging other people's spirituality and morality you don't do that that you don't take alcohol does not mean that those who take it are going to hell or God does not speak to them or they don't have the Holy Spirit no 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 don't be drunk that's just what the church um, teaches. Um, as a priest, final, final question. Um, as a priest, did you study Latin? Uh, or did you study priest. in Latin? Mm, no, but we did some bit of Latin. Um, call it elementary classical Latin. Yeah. Because um, the revelation I got was that the name Lucifer, for instance, belongs to Christ, light bearer. And if you read the Latin Vulgate, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, Peter used the word Lucifer to describe Christ in the Latin Bible. King James made the error in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, and called the devil Lucifer, and that's how the devil became Lucifer. But what the Spirit has been showing me scripturally and theologically and historically is that the devil was never the light bringer of anything. And I heard, I, was, I had the opportunity of listening to a song from the Vatican in which the word Lucifer was used to describe Christ. So I was like, yes, this is exactly the revelation I got. What is your take on this? Maybe the problem might be the English rendition. The problem might be the English rendition. But I have thought about this before, uh, coincidentally. I have told people that the name Lucifer actually means light bearer. You know? So before the devil fell, he was light bearer. Because uh, I think Isaiah 14 describes him as the day star, not even the um, um, this is so he was he was the, yes morning star he was the angel of light. So because angels are known not by personal name but by the function they carry. So before he became the devil, you could call him Lucifer. He was carrying light. But when he became the devil, he's no longer. Lucifer, he does not carry light anymore because he is darkness. And you can't find a new way in the New Testament. Jesus called him so many names. Murderer, thief, 
liar and all that but he never used ancient serpent he never used the word lucifer for him and i told my people even those of you who bear lucy what do you think is different between lucy and lucifer lucy means light and the bible says in matthew 5 that we are the light um, of the world it's the same thing with judas you don't see anybody bearing judas today but I think scripture there is no difference between Jude and Judas. I think Jude is just an abridged version of Judas. That's why when the Bible lists the apostles of Jesus, he mentioned Judas, son of this, and then Judas Iscariot. You know, it's just an abridged version of the same name. But because of the person of Judas who betrayed Jesus, nobody wants to have anything to do with the name. As if the problem is from the name. The problem is not from the name. The problem is from the person who bore the name. So that the person who bore that name live this kind of life does not mean the name has become um, corrupted. So I have told my people that Lucifer is not the devil is no longer Lucifer, even though by call it popular piety we have decided to identify him as Lucifer but please uh, please don't teach anybody to go and name his son Lucifer the son will not forgive the person for the rest in my church we believe especially if you if you take time out to read um, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 19 in Latin um, yes Peter called Christ, he said, and Lucifer will rise in your hearts. He's like, just doubt me for it. So um, I'm glad that at least <laughs> I don't feel lost with you. I can I can share my uh, my views and I don't think I'm crazy at least. So thank you so much for joining us. And one final note, what advice do you have to people who are listening to you? I know you're tired. You've been on the protest grounds. You're supposed to send me some of your pictures and videos from the protest grounds so I can include yeah. in, uh, yeah. in this video. Please, a parting note to all those who hold you in high esteem. Um, I just want to encourage them to um, Remain focused and um, they shouldn't get um, distracted. And um, um, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 4, he said, Our victory over the world is our faith. If you are a Christian and you are listening to me, build your faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Build your faith. When your faith is strong, there are so many superstitious things we do as Christians, both harmless and harmful ones that are not necessary. Build your faith and then and don't be an ignoramus. Be active in politics, be active in economies, be active in uh, sports. You know, be versatile as a Christian because, see, the world is bigger than your Christian faith and God made it so. Your Christian faith is supposed to be um, 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 a framework through which you navigate through the world, through which you, it is important, you still have to live. So, build your faith, but make sure you have, but Jesus said we should be as wise as the serpent and as innocent as, uh, as, as the dove, no. you know. So I want to encourage them um, to not be discouraged no matter what they are going through and uh, they should uh, focus on Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Our faith. <laughs> thank you so much Father Uloma thank you for your time it's been wonderful hosting you and I look forward to another session with you uh, this time I'm sure by then you'll have uh, received the dividends of NSAS and you can now go deeper doctrinally and discuss so many things that people want um, to have knowledge of thank you so much and God bless you and we truly appreciate you we truly truly appreciate you thank, thank you thank you daddy please thank you for this honor i appreciate you too god bless you and bless your ministry god bless you too and your ministry too take care all right bye bye bye, bye. 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 <laughs> share your exciting moments with your family and friends on wildcatholic.com Sign up with the largest community of Catholics online, make new friends, chat, post pictures and videos, make and receive audios and video calls, interact with lots of priests and religions. Download the app from Google Play Store.